Okay, about a 10 second warning and we're gonna shut off the lights for just a, a couple minutes. In the digital age, information is power. But what if that power was used to manipulate deceive and control welcome to the world of information warfare a modern battleground where truth is often a casualty and your perception is the target from false narratives to targeted disinformation adversaries use sophisticated tactics to spread confusion and create division these tactics aren't just random they're strategic they exploit our emotions, sow distrust, and polarize societies. Understanding how information is used as a weapon is crucial to defend against these attacks. In hybrid warfare, information is used to achieve an advantage in which our adversaries seek to weaken our society. In the end, the most effective weapon against information warfare is awareness, education, and training this is why we are here this is why we are being proactive in this domain welcome to norwich university's military writers symposium manipulated and all of us are susceptible. The script that you just heard, it's true. Our vision at Norwich is to be a leader in research, education, and understanding in this field. It is true that hybrid and cognitive warfare is in hyperdrive and many in our society are unaware. It's one thing to tell you about constructing a version of reality and it's quite the other to have you experience the process. Our societies have just begun the nexus between technology, AI, cognitive computing, and quantum computing. The future can be predicted, but we will be off just as much as those who tried to predict 2024 100 years ago, where in 1924 we were just replacing horses and only 45% of Americans had electricity. Morgan Freeman was not, as some of you suspected, real, but how long did it take for you to realize that? The audio and video were created by Cadet Brendan Coyne, who's conducting research in this area, and Dr. Jonathan Atkins, sitting right up front. Dr. Atkins is from NU's Leahy School of Cybersecurity and Advanced Computing, and he created the avatar. My name is Dr. Travis Morris, and I have the honor of being the Executive Director of the Military Writer Symposium and the Peace and War Center Director. I would like to welcome you to this year's symposium, and we are thrilled that you're able to attend. We welcome our distinguished guests from all over the world, and thank you in advance for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Lieutenant General Potter, uh, we are so thankful for you being here, ma'am, and we look forward to hearing your remarks in a few minutes. The Military Writers Symposium exists to advance our understanding of significant security challenges that we face in the 21st century. Our nation's future leaders where the students in this room and the students who are on campus will see a battlefield that is fought on multiple fronts, both in war and in peacetime. Preparing leaders for the future has been Norwich's business for over 200 years. It's what we do, it's what we will always do. Norwich is currently a thought leader in the information warfare space. We have undergraduate and graduate minors and certificates we do information warfare simulations, information warfare research and internships, and software applications are dedicated to this domain. We and our partners, like Norwich University Applied Research Institute, are proud to be in the lead in understanding this critical subject. Over the next two days, you, our campus, 
and community have an excellent program before you. We would like to encourage you to attend as many of these sessions as you can, to ask questions, and to interact with our guests. The symposium and the Colby Award would not be possible without the support of the university leadership and the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. A heartfelt thanks to Lieutenant General John Broadmeadow, President of Norwich University, Provost and Dean of the Faculty, Brigadier General Gaines, PhD, Associate Provost for Research and Chief Research Officer, Dr. Kulkarni, Dr. Leah Williams, Senior Associate Provost, Commandant and Vice President of Student Affairs, Brigadier General McCullough, the Military Writers Associates, Norwich University's development and for their continued support. So this year's theme, Perception Wars, the battle to control reality emphasizes that an information war is happening and it will only accelerate and it impacts absolutely all of us in this room. The next two days will unpack the ingredients of the current informational environment. This morning, we are very fortunate to have Lieutenant General Potter deliver our keynote address and her remarks afterwards. We should have some time for question and answer and you'll see two mics that or to your left and to your right. So if you have questions, you can be thinking about that should we have time at the end. And also, Chatham House rules apply. If you're not certain what that is, just briefly, the information that is shared in this room does not need to be attributed. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Lieutenant General John Broadmeadow, Norwich's 25th president, who is the highest ranking Marine officer to ever graduate. Just a few, few couple remarks, so I got it. He's the highest ranking Marine officer to ever graduate Norwich. He has a very distinguished 37 years of Marine Corps service. He will introduce our keynote speaker. So let's welcome him with a round of applause. Welcome, sir. Hey, hey come here. We'll stand here one second. Um, where's your team? Can I get your team to stand up? I'm going to start with a thank you. And there's probably going to be a lot of these throughout the day. but, but. Um, you know, like, like many of you know, uh, although I've been around this university uh, since 1979, uh, uh, a lot of things that I'm seeing now as your president are my first. And while I've heard about the Military Writers Symposium and I've heard about our Peace and War Center, um, I really never understood it. Um, what I am learning at a very rapid rate here is that this is, truly is uh, a world-class program that we've got here. We really do talk about some cutting-edge things. I had a great opportunity to sit through uh, an information warfare exercise that our students and students from other senior military colleges sat through, um, and, it, and it really opened my eyes as to how good it was. And in preparing for, for uh, our event this year, I really became to uh, understand that uh, Dr. Morris and his team, where's your team? They're probably they're all, all they're all out and about. <laughs> so good. So on behalf of all of them, I want to say uh, on behalf of all of us, I want to say thank you for, thank you, for putting this on. And I think a lot of other people are probably going to do that throughout this. Uh, but as the new guy on the block here, I wanted to say thank you, sir. Thank you very much for all that you've done, Travis. Thank you. So now this better go off without a hitch, right? So. All right. Um, so now I can skip my whole first paragraph here. Uh, it really is a, a pleasure to have you all here. I'm glad to see uh, a number of these seats uh, filled up, and I know that people will be coming in and out throughout the day. Uh, this is our 30th annual symposium. 30 years of continuous effort and evolution is impressive and something that we should all be very proud of. Our dedicated faculty and staff have spent three decades refining this symposium into a staple event that takes place on our campus every year. It's important that we create a space not only to discuss exceptional military writing, but one where we can learn from high-level professionals in person right here in Northfield. This year, we're hosting some experts who are exploring one of the most pressing threats to global peace in history, information warfare. You know, uh, just a, a quick deviation and something I'd like you to keep in mind uh, as we go through this that one of my mentors said, and, and he's pretty famously quoted out there, that the nature of warfare does not change, but the character of warfare continually evolves. And I'd like you to kind of keep that in mind as you go through the conversations over the next couple days. Warfare does constantly evolve. 
and weapons become more potent and more powerful to the point where kinetically the earth could be destroyed in a matter of minutes. But information warfare is dangerous in a very different way. You know, when I was a student here in the early 80s, we were keenly aware of the threat of nuclear war, but the internet was barely even discussed. And the vast cyber networks that we have today didn't even exist. It's quite astonishing how technological advancements, not just traditional weapons, pose some of the greatest threats to our future. It's crucial that we understand the role of artificial intelligence in cybersecurity and their hold on hybrid warfare. What are the consequences of wartime propaganda transforming into everyday attacks on reality? How do we keep our strategic and tactical information safe from our enemies? How do we employ artificial intelligence to ensure our security while others are exploiting it and undermining it? We recognize the importance of keeping abreast of all these changes, but we hold events like this one because we want to be ahead of the curve. 30 years into its existence, this is still the only symposium of, the only symposium of its kind, bringing together some of the brightest minds from field and the classroom. Today, I'm proud to introduce one of those bright minds, our keynote speaker, United States Army Lieutenant General Laura Potter the 58th director of the Army staff. There's har har hardly a better person we could highlight today. General Potter's commissioned in the Military Intelligence Corps in 1989. She's built an impressive resume throughout the years. She's seen assignments and deployments around the globe, and she's been awarded significant medals to include the Defense Superior Service Medal. Prior to her role as the director of the Army staff, she's held roles as the U.S. Army Deputy Chief of Staff G2, the Commanding General at the U.S. Army Intelligence Center of Excellence at Fort Huachuca, and the Director J-2 of U.S. European Command. What all of those say is that she truly is an expert in this field. Her professional experience is underscored by her commitment to education, as she is a distinguished military graduate of Dickinson College, where she studied Russian and Spanish, a graduate of Georgetown's School of Foreign Service, the Center of Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies, and a graduate of the Naval War College, something I'm very happy to see on your resume, uh, with a Master's in National Security and Strategic Studies. We're very lucky to have her with us today, and I'm very proud to be able to do the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Potter. Well, thanks everyone. I can't tell you how honored I am to be here. Um, <clears throat> when I was preparing for these remarks, uh, I noticed that the theme uh, for my remarks was two truths and a lie, and life would be so easy if that's all we had to contend with. But the two truths are one, this topic <clears throat> is absolutely timely and appropriate for this symposium. And the second truth that goes with it is as a career intelligence officer, I do believe this is the greatest threat to our national security and our way of life uh, that we face as a military and as a nation. The lie would be that we're prepared to address it. And there certainly is work being done, but there's a lot more work left to do. And I'm gonna sort of touch on some of my thoughts on that as I close. Um, so as General Broadmeadow mentioned, I'm the 58th director of the Army staff, or as we call it, the DAS. And uh, that job sort of keeps the trains running in the Pentagon, so I don't get out much. So this is a real treat to be able to step away and um, be back on the Norwich campus. I'm truly honored to be sharing this day with some tremendously gifted intellectuals, thinkers, and writers who are very steeped in the theme of the symposium. Um, and I, what I hope to do is to contribute just a little bit based on my observations from 35 years in the Army. Um, before I do that, though, I'd like to begin by thanking Norwich University for all that it has done over the past two centuries to support and defend our nation. It's an absolute privilege to be back here, especially as the university is also celebrating its 50th anniversary of the first women in the Corps of Cadets. 
You might wonder why I said back on this campus. As some of you know, Norwich University founded a Russian school at Wyndham College in 1958, and the school moved to Norwich 10 years later and grew a reputation for being one of the best Russian immersion programs in the United States during the Cold War. And while the threat that we were most concerned about at the time was the nuclear arsenal and this idea of a bipolar world, understanding what's written in the native language of your adversary was really important to me at the time. In the summer of 1987, I arrived on this campus. The atmosphere, the campus setting, the small town environment created the perfect learning environment for maturing one's language skills. And to this day, I treasure my time here. <clears throat> It's also the birthplace of the Reserve Officer Training Corps, and as a product of ROTC, and in, 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 in anticipation of speaking here today, I found myself reflecting on just how impactful that's been to our nation's history. And it was a pretty radical thought at the time, but the efforts of this school's founder, Captain Alden Partridge, have become a cornerstone in our nation's preparedness to meet the many challenges and conflicts it's encountered over the past two plus centuries. His foresight allowed for a wider net to be cast across our citizenry, giving young and energetic and aspiring college students, just like many in this audience, the opportunity to enter into the Army's officer corps. It gave those willing to not just serve, but to lead their fellow countrymen and women a means of commissioning other than attendance at one of our prestigious military academies. This is a legacy that Norwich should always be tremendously proud of. Um, so with that said, for everyone who organized this and for the awesome institution that it represents, I'd like everyone to please give Norwich a round of applause. Okay, now, now I'm going to go on to the topic at hand. And I will tell you, I really struggled with crafting these remarks. And part of the reason I struggled is because I think I could spend five hours talking about this, I could probably spend more, because as I look back at my career, whether it was my first assignment in Korea, whether it was a deployment to um, Georgia during the Russia-Georgia War that began in 1992, whether it was the Balkans of the 90s, the narratives of both ISIS and Russia during the War on Terror, or what we face today, I just have more ideas in my head than we probably have time to share. And as I looked at the bios of the excellent panelists and awardees that you will listen to during the symposium, I also felt like there's a part of me that may not be telling some of you much more than you already know or have observed if you are a savvy and sophisticated consumer of information. So Joan of Arc is known to have said that all battles are first won or lost in the mind. And the idea behind that quote is that a mental state, individual or collective, plays a crucial role in determining the outcome of a battle. And at the time it was said, it was likely more about the mental strength, toughness, and courage of individuals and armies to ensure the ensuing physical battle. But if we apply it to today's global security challenges, the battle for the mind, for minds are taking place now. In the context of great power competition, and in the context of deterrence, and in the context of assuring our allies and partners. And our adversaries have more foot soldiers and weapons in this battle than we do. And if we consider the instruments of national power, diplomatic, information, military, and economic, all of which have perception wars woven into them, three of those four, diplomacy, military, and economics, generally have pretty well codified and understood rules of the road. We understand how they're implemented. We understand how our decisions are made to exercise those instruments of national power. However, information is much broader. It's less well-defined, and how we think about that as an instrument of national power has changed during my career. It requires not just a whole-of-government approach, but a whole-of-nation approach. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that conditions for victory in a future conflict, state on state conflict, are being established today. Not with the emplacement of long range fire systems, drone swarms, defensive trench lines, or intersecting fields of fire. 
They're being set through a continuous campaign of information dominance, access, and influence with adversaries who do not share our values or respect our way of life. And as I know all of you know, we're all being influenced right now every day. Citizens across the globe are on some type of electronic device that is feeding information from countless plat platforms through myriad applications augmented with algorithms, machine learning, avatars, deep fakes. And it's a continuous feedback loop that informs data brokers and establishes fundamental biases in how we approach our thinking. They influence our perceptions of the world and they influence our perceptions of state and local environments that we are living in. They influence our attitudes and they are nudging every one of us in one direction or another on everything from what type of shoes to buy to the pros and cons of a separatist movement in some country across the globe to who is on the right and just side of a war. And I think we're well past the ability of being able to reverse or avoid this because of the profits it generates. For a business, that's profits of being a data broker. For an adversary, it's the profit of being able to destroy or stabilize, destabilize a successful or democratic nation. So with that, we all must be very cognizant of the implications this has for us as private citizens and the implications it has for our national defense. And as most of you know, um, we orient our military strategy based on the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. And the national defense strategy that was written early in this administration um, establishes China as a pacing challenge Russia as an acute threat and acknowledges the threats we face from Iran, North Korea, and the continued persistence of violent extremist organizations. I could talk about any one of those state or non-state actors that contest us in the information space, but based on my background and years of experience in Europe, I'm gonna focus on Russia, and then I'll be happy to take questions later if you wanna talk about something else. Russia is perhaps the most adept in its state-sponsored campaign to control the truth, the narrative, and the reality to, to achieve both political and military aims. They have a long-standing tradition of information confrontation, obfuscation or maskarovka, active measures, manipulation, and in fact, it's part of their written national security policy and their military doctrine. Information warfare is at the forefront of their statecraft and their military planning. They blur the lines between official government communication, their intelligence services, law enforcement, the armed forces, and they condone and or support proxies, private military companies, and criminal networks to all be active in this space. Russia uses a wide variety of media to deploy and then volumize their narratives. Social media, traditional print and online media, television such as Russia Today aired globally in eight languages, books, and quite frankly, people on the ground fomenting disagreement and protest. I recall when I was the US European Command J2 and there was a significant threat from the separatist movement in Catalonia, Spain, the intelligence leaders of that country sharing with me the extent to which Russia played a hand in that. My colleagues in Denmark, very concerned about the extent to which Russia, and to a lesser extent China, are fomenting discord in Greenland. And certainly concerns that our colleagues in the United Kingdom prior to Brexit and now looking at the cohesion of the United Kingdom have when it comes to Russia's role in their domestic issues. And as an intelligence officer in the US Army, I don't study this landscape in the United States of America. Uh, but you can imagine, um, and those of you that do study it, uh, you can imagine that uh, what they're able to do abroad, they're certainly able to do inside our shores, given the lack of boundaries in the information space. Uh, social and online media uh, obviously is uh, the most growing and pervasive medium that Russia uses, and it's made even more challenging by advances in technology, to include a few I've mentioned. 
um, the development of sophisticated algorithms, uh, deep fakes, avatars, the dark web, etc. Content is generally high quality. Um, in every capital I traveled to um, when I lived in Europe for five years straight, um, I would flip on RT um, when I got to my hotel room, listen to it in Russian, then I'd flip over and listen to it in Spanish, perhaps, or English. And it's very, very high quality. And of really interesting significance, it's partially true. And sometimes that part true is 10% part true. And sometimes it's like 80 to 90% part true. And the false part is the piercing weapon that hits the center of the target. That partial truth makes the weapon hard to discern if you are not a savvy and sophisticated consumer of information. It's also tailored. It's tailored from a global perspective, if that is the appropriate narrative, as it was, for example, during COVID. It's tailored for a regional narrative, as it might be in the Balkans or in the Russia-Ukraine war right now, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And it's tailored down to micro-narratives. A micro-narrative might be something going on in the Republic of Georgia relative to South Ossetia. Um, a micro-narrative might be the Catalonia example that I gave you. And while one might argue that democracies have the same mediums to deliver the truth or counter a false narrative, in my observation, we don't have a system in place to recognize the false narrative, including its, its depth and breadth, nor do we have the ability to respond in a dynamic and a persistent way. And by dynamic and persistent, I mean, if the lie and the truth were both runners, the lie is running an international or global ultramarathon, and the truth is on the ground putting its running shoes on, getting ready for a regional or a domestic 50-yard dash. So Russia plays a short game, they play a sharp game, and they play a long game. In 1995 in Georgia, I was a, I was a United Nations military observer living on the Abkhaz side of the Russian-Georgian um, conflict. Um, and I witnessed firsthand Russia's ability during that war and in the immediate aftermath of that war to convince nations around the globe that Georgia's post-Soviet president, Zviad Gamsakhordia's slogan of Georgia for the Georgians was juxtaposed not against Russians, it was juxtaposed against the ethnicities inside Russia's border. And Russia took advantage of that narrative to convince itself and a few of its um, neighbors that the Abkhaz people needed to be freed. And in fact, that it was a justified war. So the Abkhaz population is about 1.7% of the Georgian territory. And when that war turned into a ceasefire, Russia had successfully achieved a 17% occupation of Georgian territory. And then ironically, the Russians were the peacekeepers keeping the peace. And when I explain this peacekeeping example, um, I use an example of if we could imagine that North Carolina and South Carolina were at war with one another. And the North Carolina peacekeepers that were there to make sure rules and reg regulations were followed were from Camp Liberty, North Carolina. And the South Carolina peacekeepers were from Fort Cavazos, Texas. Well, that was the situation in Georgia. A local Russian airborne unit that lived in Abkhazia, married Abkhaz women, had property in Abkhazia, were in charge of keeping the rules on that side of the border. And needless to say, any atrocities or misbehavior um, done by the Russians went unnoticed and undocumented. On the Georgian side of the border, every step the Georgians took if they went out of line once, was documented to the United Nations. And not only was that a problem for the UN mission, but it was a problem for how Russia portrayed the Georgian government and the status of that country um, in its information narrative. 
Uh, many years later, I was the senior intelligence officer in U.S. Army Europe during the first Russia-Ukraine war. And the stories of no Russian troops, and then little green men, and eventually Russian-led separatist forces are now well known. But they were so effective at the time that even a year into that war, some of my most senior counterparts in very um, mature NATO nations, and by mature I mean steeped militaries, um, actually questioned whether the Russians were in Donetsk and Luhansk. And I used to say to them, you know, separatists cannot build artillery shells in their basement, and separatists cannot fix armored fighting vehicles in their garage. But the narrative coming out of Russia of who was doing what inside Donetsk and Luhansk was so pervasive that even men and women who were my colleagues that had spent decades in the military actually questioned whether the Russians were in Luhansk and Donetsk. And when Russia was asked in 2015, this was one of my favorite experiences actually, when Russia was asked in 2015 to address the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, a 58-nation organization headquartered in Vienna, Austria. Um, I had the opportunity to sit in that forum with my commander, the commander of US Army Europe at the time. And the French delegation spoke first, and then the American delegation spoke, and both delegations very articulately laid out the case for why this was an illegal invasion and an illegal annexation and all of the um, things that Russia had done that were counter to international law and in fact rose to the level of war crimes. The audience was gripped with these two delegations' presentations. And I would look around the room and notice that you, you could hear a pin drop. So the third delegate to speak was the Russian delegation. And the witness, uh, sat down, uh, took out his notes. And there was a screen like this behind the delegation. And all of a sudden, a slideshow came up. And the slideshow was a rolling slideshow of the most beautiful art done by Russian artists in the history of the nation. And for those of you who are connoisseurs of Russian art, they have some of the most beautiful art in the world. So I looked around at the very same audience who during the first two presentations was gripped with what the speakers were saying and they were all looking at the art. And they weren't paying attention to what the delegate was actually saying as he carefully walked through the reasons why in the eyes of President Putin and the Russian leadership, the war was in fact just based on Russia, based on NATO not being a defensive alliance but its expansion posing a direct threat to Russia's national security. It was truly a remarkable presentation. In the second Russia-Ukraine war, Russia has continued to refine the aspects of the perception, both uh, domestically and across the globe, that have given them some advantages in battle. So for example, when there's a Ukrainian deep strike inside Crimea, Russia often posts on social media ahead of the Ukrainians or any local um, onlooker that everything was shot down before the strike was even completed so that they can get their message out before the Ukrainians can. And as many of you know, the first message is often the winning message because all the subsequent messages have to fight back um, to counter that narrative. Um, they also have made false accusations against the Ukrainians of war crimes. They've made false accusations of body counts backed up with manufactured evidence, um, and the list goes on. These type of tax tactics should concern us on two fronts. First, they significantly increase the fog and friction of war. And second, they have the potential to slow down our decision making and thus increase risk to both the mission and the force. And second, if believed, they have the potential to erode will. Will of a fighting force, will of a nation, will or cohesion of an alliance, will of citizen, citizenries that don't actually know what the ground truth really is. 
The ChemBio narrative is also something that should concern us. And while I have used tactical examples heretofore, I think the ChemBio narrative is something we should study and we should appreciate. It's probably the most significant example of the long game um, that um, is, is potentially very threatening. So for decades, the Soviet Union and then Russia has accused the United States of developing biological weapons to sow fear, to create mistrust, and to divert attention from other Russian misbehavior. These false narratives date back to the Korean War, um, to genetic engineering of HIV in the 1980s, to migratory birds and bats designed to threaten Russians in the midst of this current Russia-Ukraine war. These examples are a snapshot of Russia's multi-decade long game to, to reverse post-Soviet losses, to erode NATO cohesion, and to discredit European democracies. So I think it's important, and, and I could give hundreds of examples, so I had to sort of cut off my examples at some point, but I think it's really important that part of this symposium thinks about what we should do about this. So I penned out a few things, um, some military, some not. So first is a whole of education, a whole of nation education on, on this type of threat and how to be a sophisticated consumer of information. And I'm very proud of what Norwich University has done in this area with the information warfare area of concentration. Um, but, you know, I have a senior in high school, and we're, we live in Arlington, Virginia. It's known to be a pretty good school district. And so I was getting ready for these remarks, and I asked my high school senior, at any time in high school, has anyone, your government teacher, your history teacher, your social studies teacher, has anyone actually talked to you about what this threat is like? Has anyone talked to you about how you should consume information and the threats of you consuming mis or disinformation. And he literally said, Mom, I have no idea what you're talking about. And, you know, because he's the son of a career intel officer, he has to suffer through reading real, like, foundational works that are cited and, you know, that are backed up and you can sort of verify the truth on. But I imagine the vast majority of his friends don't. And so as laudatory as it is that a place like this has an area of concentration, it is far too late. It's an alarm bell that I think really needs to be sounded to our Department of Education. When I know there's some people in here whose hair is just as gray as mine, so you probably remember in your childhood, even at a very young, impressionable age, being educated on the nuclear threat. You probably had to do a drill in school about it. And we are raising a generation of children who do not know how to protect themselves from false narratives. So that whole of nation education is to me the first and a very important step. We also have to enhance our use of technology. So we talk about the development of AI and machine learning, but we also have to continue to develop technology that can detect um, false narratives that can verify the truth, that can catalog bad actors. You know, if you have um, a very purposeful lie done by um, a, a ecosystem of people, whether it's trolls inside a nation state or whether it's a machine-enabled volumizing of information, we need to have the technology in place that can um, blunt the effects of that. And within the Army, uh, we have worked very hard to develop doctrine. Um, we've established um, the parameters of information advantage, um, and we have developed forces inside the Army. So Army Cyber Command um, has responsibility for um, understanding what's going on in this space, both the technical threat vectors through a cyber-enabled operation and what is going on in the um, influence area. And then we've also developed teams at our theater armies called Theater Information Advantage Detachments, and their job is to be able to assist those theater commanders in assessing what is going on in the information environment. 
The last thing I would say in a military context is the narratives associated with state or non-state actors that intend, intend to do us harm in a military context have to be thought of using some of the same doctrinal terms we use in a physical war. So we have to think about it as an attack, an ambush. We have to realize that they are maneuvering in the information space. And one very important aspect in a military operation of analyzing this is being able to do what we call battle damage assessment. In a kinetic strike, battle damage assessment is relatively easy. You bomb a building and you can see the effects with the human eye. You can send something to look at the effects. You can send a person to look at the effects. In the information space, the battle the dam damage assessment is much, much harder. And that's gonna require a different level of analysis and it will also need to be aided by technology. So to understand, you know, in the, in the first Russia-Ukraine war, the Russians accused a German battalion commander who was in NATO's enhanced forward presence in Lithuania of being a Nazi. And they accused an American of committing a sexual assault on a Ukrainian woman in Kyiv. Those can have very strategic effects if you think of the reaction in Germany to that or fear the Lithuanians might have given the history that um, they endured in the last century. So how to understand what was the impact of that message and what do we as a military need to do about it beyond a tweet or a public affairs statement or an acknowledgement in a declarative way that that, 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 that wasn't true. So I'm going to wrap it up there by saying from a strategic long game level to anything that would help us um, deter um, adversaries in the future, shore up the cohesion we have with our allies and partners and be prepared for this should we ever go to conflict are extremely important. So I commend to all of you to think in this space, to write in this space, and to teach and coach those coming up behind you in this space, that it's really critical that we move out with a whole nation approach. And with that, I wanna thank you for your time, and I stand ready for your questions. So at this time, if you have any questions, please move to both, both mics. And while I know there's questions in the audience, there's a bunch of bright students that have focused on IW for, for a while. So while that's happening, ma'am, may I just start us off with a question. Thinking back to 9-11, there were many in the intel community, many in the DOD that were talking about terrorism. But it took an event like 9-11 for us to pivot. There are those that are talking about, and this is like yourself, ma'am, that's why we're glad you're here, about how important this topic is. Do you think that it will take a significant IW event here in the state, much like those in Europe or other countries have experienced, for us to actually recognize at a whole of government level the importance of this, this threat? Um, I don't know if it could or would be one significant event. I think the, the cumulative nature, like, you know, if there was a significant chem bio incident, because I use that as my last example. If there was a significant event somewhere in the world, um, you know, I think back to the um, Skripal assassination attempt in the United Kingdom. I was, about two months after that assassination attempt, I was in line at the, um, you know, to go through where you show your pa passport control, and I was standing next to a relatively senior diplomat, and he just, we struck up a conversation, and he said, it's really a shame that, you know, some of that toxic agent might have come from that, the labs here in the UK. And I was flabbergasted. Like, are you kidding me? Flabbergasted. So we have these, it's like your, you know, your heartbeat on your EKG. We have these points in time where we're seized with how terrible that is. But to me, it's very hard for it to have a 9-11 type effect. It, it does on the cyber and high-end tech intrusion kind of things, but... On the narrative side, it's very hard for us to do this. And I think if you look at like the growth of the Global Engagement Center in the State Department and some of the things we've done over the last several years, there is knowledge in 
every one of our departments of the government that it's a problem. I just don't think we're organized and I don't think we have a collective knot in our stomach about the need to not run the 50 yard dash. You know, that we've got to have marathon runners. Yes. Good morning, ma'am. My name is Cadet Berg. Uh, I'm a biochemistry major. My question today was, you mentioned that state uh, organizations have an advantage in the IW space. Do you think that we model our own IW preparation after Russia, and do you think that we should? So, I mean, obviously, there's a huge difference in terms of our values, and, you know, Russia has no concern about putting forth lies and false narratives and disinformation. So our values ground us in that, and that, that'll always be a difference. Um, and we can never lose sight of that. Um, in terms of organization, Russia and China and others have just applied more human beings to this. I mean, they have thousands and thousands of people working on this. And uh, I don't know if we have a whole of government level of ambition to do that, but as I mentioned, they've got more foot soldiers at it than we do. But we do have ways to, to expand some of our information warfare um, tactics in a, in a fight. We just can't lose sight of in the active campaigning space that we're in, we gotta stay wedded to the truth and to our values. Yes, ma'am, thank you, ma'am. Okay, this side. Good morning, ma'am. My name's Chandler Bullinger. <clears throat> I study cybersecurity. I'm a senior here at Norwich University. Um, I have a question. It's probably a weird one, um, and this is more of my personal experience. Um, I meet people throughout the United States um, from the East Coast, West Coast, here at Norwich University in the military. Um, how you say you talk about education being very important with cybersecurity, um, just in our recognizing our threats that we have. Um, what do you tell those people that don't really care? And there's people sometimes here at Norwich University not calling Norwich University out. It's just people who are not fully aware of the threat with China and Russia. Um, they will download TikTok or they will, they will click those links. They don't really care what they're reading. Um, what, type of, what, what should we, as we are aware, we're probably aware of the threat here, but what about those people that don't? What's the message we should be trying to convince them that, hey, this is a real issue, you know? There are people consistently outside the United States that want to hurt us. Yeah. And saying that straightforward to them probably isn't gonna work. They're like, oh, that's not real. And yeah. so I have a question for you. What, what do you think on that? And that's kind of my experience I've seen it, because there's a lot of people that don't care, so thank you. Well, um, you know, I think, first of all, Ha when, when we come upon examples that we know are not only false narratives, but are potentially destructive, calling them out to our colleagues, like just educating people on whether they realize that what they're seeing is mis and disinformation, and more importantly, whether they understand the objectives of that adversary. So I sort of describe Russia's objective in the information space as destructive. It wants to destruct or disturb or disarray what's going on inside a country. Stra China's is a little more strategically outcompete, but they both have a national objective that runs counter to the West, and we need to educate our colleagues on that when we see it. I don't think we're ever going to get away from local self-interest, <laughs> like we read what we want to read, we buy what we want to buy, but we have to educate ourselves on what's behind that. Thank you, ma'am. So unfortunately, we are out of time. However, we do appreciate the questions that you have. Perhaps you could stay around. We have some experts that you could ask, and perhaps the general may be able to entertain just a couple of questions. But let's give Lieutenant General Potter a round of applause. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I was really honored uh, to be able to be the keynote for such an important topic. And um, I hope you all continue to think and write about it, because I do think it's critical to our national security. And for any of you who had a question but didn't get a chance to ask it, uh, my aide, Major Steve Orban's in the room. He's got my business cards. The staff here knows how to reach me, because um, this is a dialogue we got to continue to have with our most young people in the audience and the most senior experts that are thinking and writing on this. Thanks very much. Thank you, ma'am.